maybe a true depiction of that. Um, I have an honorable pleasure of welcoming Professor Mike Britton with us today. He was born and schooled in East London where uh, the first silicon uh, was caught and maintained his interest in the iconic fish throughout his career as a research scientist at Rhodes University and science educator at the two Oceans Aquarium and Cape Town Science Center. He has observed the lives of silicon in the Comoros, a series of four islands, which he will tell us about, and uh, documented their natural and um, cultural history during his extensive travels abroad. He has recently been awarded the prestigious Maloth Medal by the Royal Science of South Africa for his contributions to science and science education. Now, um, he's asked me precisely not to say too much about his bio. <laughs> so I'm not gonna go any further than that because of I think uh, during his presentation, he'll tell us more about him. What an absolute pleasure to have you with us, Prof. It's an absolute privilege to have you with us. And, um, you know, I don't have much to say, uh, but to say thank you for making time uh, to share the wonderful work that you've done. And I'm so pleased uh, that we could have, uh, you know, South Africa has honored you with this wonderful uh, Maloth medal um, in this lifetime. And today we get to appreciate your work and actually celebrate in this wonderful research work that you've done. So without any waste of time, let me hand over to you and to the rest of the panelists to remember to post your questions on the Q&A and I will see you guys on the other side. Prof, over to you. Thank you very much, John, for that wonderful introduction. And it's a great pleasure to talk to all of the participants in this Room to Grow and Bush Wednesday talk. I'm going to share with you one of the greatest scientific stories ever, a story that started in South Africa and continues um, in South Africa and something of which we can be very proud. The main source material for my book are these uh, for my talk are these three books published by Penguin Random House, The Fishy Smiths, which is a biography of two of the main culprits, JLB and Margaret Smith, The Amazing Coelacanth and The Annotated Old Forelegs. Uh, it's, it's a story not only about a fish, but about the remarkable people involved in the discovery and, and study of this fish and um, some peculiar events that happened along the way. Now it all started back in 1836 when this Swiss American uh, paleontologist, Louis Agassiz, found some fossils in England. And these fossils were, uh, fish fossils were characterized by having hollow spines in the tail fin. So he called it coelacanthus, which is, means hollow spine. And that was really the first interaction that humans had with this group of fishes. Over the next hundred years, over 90 species of extinct coelacanths were found in the fossil record all over the world on all continents, including Africa and, and even Antarctica, with a particularly rich fossil coelacanth fauna in Madagascar. So it's a group of fishes that was very well known to paleontologists. Coelacanths first evolved about 420 million years ago. So that's about 180 million years before the dinosaurs. So in evolutionary terms, the dinosaurs are sort of mere pickanins compared with the coelacanth. The coelacanths coexisted with the dinosaurs as suggested in this artist's depiction, although they would have looked rather different at that time. And in fact, there's even evidence that some dinosaurs ate coelacanths, such as this African uh, amphibious dinosaur, Spinosaurus aegyptiarchus. We found fossil coelacanths in the fossil stomachs of Spinosaurus. And research on fossil coelacanths continues um, for, in South Africa. This is Robert Guess of the Albany Museum who's found the small estuarine coelacanth, which is called Serenichthys cowiensis, um, near Grahamstown. Now the dramatic events of 65 million years ago, when a meteorite struck the earth, and there was also a lot of volcanic activity, caused most large animals on land, in the air, and in the water to go extinct, including the dinosaurs. And the coelacanth's fossil record also ends at that time. So it was perfectly logical for scientists to conclude 
that the coelacanth group, along with all the dinosaurs, had gone extinct. Now let's look at the first character in this saga. Um, and that is J.L.B. Smith. He, here he is, he's a young boy, three or four years old. He was born in Hrafrenet in the Karoo in 1897. Now, as you know, there are not many fishes in the Karoo. So he would have occupied his time as a budding naturalist, um, catching kohol manikis and, and looking at birds. The first time he had an opportunity to go to the sea was when he was 10 years old and his family went on holiday by train to George and then by Cape Cod to Neisner um, and stayed in this cottage on the edge of Neisner Lagoon. And there he experienced the thrill of catching his very first fish, a blacktail, and fishing hooked him then for the rest of his life. In fact, when he went back to his Karoo home, he practiced his casting by throwing, uh, by casting into fowl's pens with grasshopper bait and catching chickens with his fishing rod. The Smith family eventually moved to the coast, um, living in Somerset West, and J.L.B. Smith, uh, for the first time, was able to attend a good school, Diocese and College Bishops in Cape Town. And there, the um, records of his time there record that he found the remains of an old museum that students at the school had started. And his science teacher, Barty Sutton, comment, commented, it fired his imagination and spurred him to inquiry. Now, interestingly, J.L.B. Smith is not the only famous scientist to come out of bishops. Others include James Greathead, the engineer who is called the father of the London Underground, Alex Dutoy, famous for his theory of continental drift, and more recent characters that we know, Mark Shuttleworth, Tim Noakes, and Rob Adam. After his time at Bishops, JLB went to Victoria College, which became Stellenbosch University. And there you can see he was a brilliant scholar uh, coming first in his class in chemistry. Because at this stage, his interest was in chemistry and not in fishes. He did so well that he was able to obtain scholarships to go to Cambridge University. And there, just shortly after the end of the First World War, he studied mustard gases. And the results of his studies were subsequently used in the global ban of this uh, terrible uh, gas. He also used his time to go fishing. And here he is with the long rod uh, on the River Dee trout fishing um, in England. In 1923, he returned to South Africa as a senior lecturer in the Department of Chemistry at Rhodes University. And at, soon after arriving back, he married this young lady, Henriette Pinar, who was from the famous rugby Pinar family. Her eldest brother, Theo, was the captain of the first Springbok rugby team to tour Australia. Uh, in my biography of Smith, I reckon that this was the happiest time of his, his life. He was settled in an academic career. He was very involved in the local sports union. Yeah, you can see him at a swimming gala. And he was happily married with three children. But trouble was on the horizon. The head of the chemistry department, Sir George Corey, was a rather argumentative type, and he and Joel B. Smith didn't get on particularly well. Joel B. Smith nevertheless attracted some top students, such as Doug Rivett, and they did pioneering work in the field of organic chemistry, especially on the um, active ingredients of indigenous plants, such as buchu, research which laid the foundation uh, for the buku industry today. And interestingly, John mentioned the Marloth Medal. Uh, J.L.B. Smith received the Marloth Medal. He was the first recipient of it uh, back in 1936 for this research. But he had kept in the background his interest in angling. And he used to travel down to the coast in Port Alfred and then along the coast by ox wagon catching fishes. And because he had such an inquiring mind, he was very frustrated when he couldn't identify the fish. So he started to pop publish po popular and then scientific articles about the fishes that he caught. And between 1931 and 1938, he in fact published 17 papers on fishes and described 35 new species, even though he was an amateur ichthyologist. And the only other scientist in South Africa at the time with a knowledge of fishes was Dr. Keppel Barnard, who would later go on to become the director of the South African Museum in Cape Town, 
and with whom JLB uh, corresponded. JLB Smith is mainly known as a taxonomist and not as an illustrator of fishes, but I thought I'd show you that firstly in the top right, this 1931 drawing of a fish, which is heavily criticized as being nothing more than a cartoon. So typical of Smith, he claims to have spent over 10,000 hours teaching himself how to uh, illustrate fish and the yellowhead butterfish illustrated there in color is one of his um, artworks. Then the momentous event took place on the 23rd of December, 1938, when Captain Hendrik Hwerson, the skipper of an Irvin and Johnson steam trawler, um, caught a coelacanth while collecting fishes for the East London Museum. He brought the catch back to uh, this wharf, which is now known as Latimer's Landing, and Irvin and Johnson called the young director of the East London Museum, Marjorie Courtney Latimer, invited her to come down to the wharf and inspect the catch of fishes. She went down and having rummaged through a pile of uh, rather dull sharks and rays and skates and so on, she noticed the blue fin of a remarkable fish sticking out of the pile. And she immediately uh, recognized this as something unusual, persuaded the taxi driver to take it back to her museum and then uh, endeavored to have it preserved. Unfortunately, in the whole of East London, there wasn't enough formalin to preserve the fish properly. So she was only able to have the skin and the skull and the fins mounted. All the internal organs had to be discarded. And this was a bit of a tragedy because of course, the soft organs are not preserved in the fossil record. So it would have been great to know what they looked like. She immediately sent the sketch on the right to JLB Smith, who was the only ichthyologist um, active at the time um, in the Eastern Cape. And that sketch of Marjorie's really shows her naturalist instincts. Because as a child uh, living in remote areas with her family throughout the Eastern Cape and the Free State, uh, she and her mother and sisters had explored the natural environment and she had developed a, a formidable knowledge of natural history. And in her drawing, she identifies the main characteristics of the coelacanth, the bony plates on the head, the lobed fins, the large scale, and especially that extra lobe in the tail fin, which she called the puppy dog tail. Now this drawing has become one of the most famous drawings in the history of zoology and comparable even with Darwin's famous I think diagram shown on the top left in which Charles sketched out his early ideas on, on the relationships of animals. Now Marjorie's letter eventually reached J.L.W. Smith who was on holiday in, in Neisner, but typically he was working on holiday studying fishes. And he took one look at her diagram and immediately recognized that this was probably a fish belonging to a group that was thought to be extinct. Of course, he had to be very careful. He didn't want to embarrass Marjorie or himself by making an incorrect identification. So eventually, due to various factors, it took him 44 days before he was able to visit East London and examine the specimen. And he immediately confirmed that it is a coelacanth and later named it Latimeria chalumni after Marjorie Courtney Latimer and the Chalumna River of which it had been caught. Now Smith described the fish in leading international journals and it caused an absolute sensation worldwide. For the first time, South African science was taken to the world and people very soon realized that this was one of the greatest biological finds of the 20th century. Because the specimen had been so poor, poorly preserved, it was decided that Marjorie would escort it by train to Cape Town where a professional um, taxidermist, James Drury at the South African Museum was able to mount it. And there's a lovely story of when Marjorie arrived at the Cape Town station with the fish and hopped into a taxi and traveled to the museum. There were crowds of people on the pavement waving flags and there were umpa bands playing. And she thought it was for the coelacanth. So she sort of gave them a, a royal wave as she went along. But she learned later that there was actually British royalty in town. The fish was duly mounted by James Drury and returned to the East London Museum. The, first, the Second World War intervened, but immediately after the Second World War and in the early 50s, J.L.B. Smith decided that he had to find a second coelacanth in order to be able to study its soft anatomy that had been lost. 
And in my books, I describe some absolutely amazing adventures they had on their fish collecting expeditions up the Mozambique coast into Tanzania, Kenya, Seychelles, and elsewhere. And here you can see J.L.B. Smith with his second wife, Margaret. And I'll put on my pith helmet at this stage to, to um, echo their fashion. Uh, J.L.B. Smith looks a bit like a chimney sweep, but he's speared a, a sea urchin. And there you can see Mar uh, Margaret uh, in her safari suit and pith helmet. Now on these expeditions, which during which they were searching for the second coelacanth, as well as collecting other fishes, they encountered many dangerous animals. And here J.L.B. Smith is seen holding the deadly stonefish, uh, which they had collected. They also had problems with giant snakes. There were man-eating lions on, on the mainland. Uh, giant moray eels gave them problems, and even the, the currents and, and storms. While J.L.B. Smith was at Cambridge studying mustard gases, he also studied explosives. And he knew enough to make small bombs, which he would release in the water in order to collect fish. Obviously, this is a method that we don't use today, but it was very effective at that time, especially with the limited time he had in remote areas. And it allowed him to collect fishes that he wouldn't otherwise have been able to collect. They collected tens of thousands of fishes on these um, expeditions, but no coelacanths. And here you can see them sorting fishes uh, in the 40s in Mozambique, and then they would take them into their makeshift laboratories. And Margaret, who trained herself up as an artist, would illustrate them while J.L.B. Smith uh, was busy identifying them. Now, it's interesting that the coast in northern Mozambique where they were working, and on the left is a hand-drawn map by J.L.B. Smith, uh, which he published in his book, Old Forelegs, where they were looking for um, reef fishes as well as a coelacanth. And on the right is the same area of coast um, where satellite imagery has revealed to us that some deep sea canyons come very close inshore. And this has now been identified as the most likely habitat uh, for us to find large coelacanth populations, but they haven't been explored yet. Having collected all these fish, the Smiths um, transported them back to Grahamstown, where they uh, studied, identified, and illustrated them. This is the old ex war building, corrugated iron building, in which they worked from 1946 until 1968. And during that time, they were enormously productive. Uh, they produced the first Sea Fishes of Southern Africa book in 1949, and it's continued to be updated, and it's currently published by uh, Straight Random How, uh, by Strake uh, in Cape Town. It is regarded as probably the best book on a regional uh, fish fauna anywhere in the world. During those expeditions, J.L.B. Smith um, distributed reward re leaflets uh, illustrating the coelacanth, and they have arrowed one, which is on a notice board on Zanzibar Island uh, in Tanzania. And in September 1952, while they were on one of their expeditions, they met this remarkable man, Eric Hunt, on the right, who was an Eton graduate, but had chosen the adventurous life of a, a, a trading ship skipper um, in the Western Indian Ocean. Uh, Hunt had seen the reward poster and he spoke to the Smiths, became fascinated by their search for the coelacanth and said he would find one for them. On that rugged expedition, the Smiths were able to return from Dar es Salaam to Durban um, in a Union Castle liner, the Dunnator Castle. And when they arrived in Durban, to their amazement, there was a telegram from Eric Hunt to say he had in fact secured a coelacanth for them, could they urgently come and fetch it. Now you can imagine just a few days before Christmas, it was extremely difficult for J.L.B. Smith to get back to the Comores. There were no regular air flights or, or shipping lanes there. And uh, it, it's a very remote locality. And he resorted to extreme measures to obtain permission to use a South African military aircraft uh, to fly to the Comores. And here are just some of the many people that he spoke to. And eventually, late one night, he spoke to the Prime Minister D.F. Malon, uh, who, by the way, didn't believe in evolution and wouldn't have appreciated the full value of the coelacanth. But he happened to be an angler and he had the Smith Sea Fishes book at his bedside 
and realize that the man who wrote that book um, would not ask for a plane for trivial reasons. And to cut a long story short, this Dakota uh, 6832 was allocated to JLB Smith with a crew and they flew all the way up to the Comores uh, and they line, landed on an airstrip that had originally been built by South African troops uh, during the Second World War. And there um, they went to um, Hunt Schooner and yes, the famous picture of JLB Smith with his hand on the second seal of um, the governor of the Comores, the crew of the Dakota and some of the fishermen. And now I'm going to play you a, a short, uh, an abstract from a talk that J.B. Smith gave in Durban um, when he returned with this um, famous specimen. Eventually we got away and there on the deck swathed in cotton wool was the fish. I could not bring myself to touch it. And I asked them to open it and they did. And I knelt down to look, and I'm not ashamed to say that after all that long strain, I wept. For it was true, it was a coelacanth, and what was more wonderful, a species different from that of 1938, another coelacanth. It was more than worth all that long strain. Eric Hunt told me the story. A line fisherman, Ahmad Hussein, at the village of Dilmoni on the island of Anjouan, was fishing in 20 meters of water about 200 yards from shore and caught a large fish on the evening of the 20th of December, 1952. He took it home. Fortunately... All right, we'll leave it there. And uh, one can't blame J.L.B. Smith for... Um, introducing some errors into his talk. The fish was caught at 20 fathoms, not at 20 meters, uh, but considering that he hadn't sleep, slept for three nights, it's quite understandable. Anyway, the, the Dakota then went on to Grahamstown, uh, collected Margaret uh, Smith and William, and went on to Cape Town, and there JLB Smith showed the specimen to Dr. Milan, who was, uh, who was apparently commented are we really evolved from this fish? It's so ugly. And JLB Smith responded by saying, I've known uglier people. This second specimen is now on display permanently in the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity in Makonda, Grahamstown. After that dramatic event, JLB Smith was persuaded to write this book, Old Four Legs, The Story of the Coelacanth. And it is an absolutely riveting account. He, Apparently he wrote it while um, floating on his little um, boat called Blicky uh, with his dog Marlin out on Nysna Lagoon over a 10 day period using a pencil and a full scrap paper. Old Four Legs became one of the biggest scientific bestsellers in history. It was published in um, nine different foreign language editions, 12 different foreign language editions, sorry, and five English editions, including a braille version and here you can see the covers of some of those um, editions published around the world. We estimate that over 800,000 copies of this book were sold. In 2017, as we were approaching the 80th anniversary of the uh, capture of the first coelacanth, I approached um, Strake to republish J.L.B. Smith's famous book, Old Four Legs, but with annotations in the margin. And this is the remarkable book that was a result of that collaboration, the annotated Old Four Legs. And this book comprises a series of introductory chapters. Then the main part of the book, we've reprinted the original text in the in, to inside columns, and I've made extensive notes in the margins. And then it ends with various chapters that uh, bring one up to date on the Silicon story. Well, let's get back to the fish. After the first one in 1938, the second one in 52, coelacanths then continued to be caught um, in the Comores, uh, which was under French jurisdiction. Of course, the next sort of holy grail in coelacanth research was to film a living fish. And this is a photograph that an Italian Prosperi expedition took in 1954 and which they published all over the world. But it was subsequently found to be a fake this in fact was a handmade inflatable coelacanth that they had photographed over a coral reef. 
and was one of many examples of the skullduggery associated with coelacanth research. Eventually on the left, a dying coelacanth uh, was observed by the French scientist Jacques Moulot, but Jacques Cousteau, the Captain Planet, who's probably seen more fish than any other person alive, uh, had never seen one, even though he searched for them extensively um, with the Calypso. Sadly, in 1968, at the age of 71 years, J.L.B. Smith committed suicide using one of the chemicals that he'd studied um, as a researcher. His wife, Margaret, then launched a campaign to establish a fish research institute in his name, which she did. Uh, she was the first director of that research institute, which opened in 1977. And I took over from Margaret as, as a second director some five years later. And one of the things I initiated immediately was research on the living coelacanth in the Comore Islands. And there you can see the four um, islands, um, Grand Comore, Boheli, Anjouan, which formed the Islamic Republic, and Mayotte, which is uh, part of France. And here we are on one of our expeditions, me on the left with Robin Stobbs, and we're interviewing a coelacanth fisherman, and he offered us a nice fresh drink of coconut juice. And uh, this is the way we, you know, we found out as much as possible about their biology and the ways in which they are caught. We also looked for specimens, and we met this famous diver, Jean-Louis Giraud. I said, Jean-Louis, I believe you have a coelacanth. Where is it? And he said, oh, it's under my bed and he pulled out this dried specimen. We also examined Japanese fish prints in the local fishery school. This is a Kyutako fish print. And we were very fortunate to team up with another remarkable character, Professor Dr. Hans Fricker. Uh, Hans had been to the Comores and Madagascar as a scuba diver looking for coelacanths, having read the German edition of the Old Four Legs book. And he was determined to be the first person to observe them live in their natural environment. He built the research a submersible geo uh, seen on the right on trials in, in the Red Sea, and then subsequently the Jago, which was able to penetrate down to 400 meters um, in the Comores. And using the Jago, some absolutely remarkable research was done over the next uh, two and a half decades on the living coelacanth. And we were assisted in this by the traditional fishermen uh, who catch them from their dugout canoes. And this is an example of the spectacular photographs that Hans Fricker was able to take. And as you can see, the coelacanth is a beautiful fish, a steely blue color with a pattern of white dots, and each pattern of dots is unique. So we're able to identify individual fishes. You can also see the, um, the lobed fins and the very large tail fin with the extra lobe, uh, which is characteristic of the coelacanth. We soon learned that they are social fishes that hide in caves during the day. They hunt at night, they ambush predators on fishes and squid and crabs, and they mainly detect their prey using electroreception rather than visual cues. I had the privilege of diving um, off the south shore of Grand Comore in the Jago, and here we are at a depth of 198 meters uh, looking at coelacanths in a cave. Coelacanths are relative docile animals, and we were able to go close enough to them to, to take scales and also insert tags on them for our research. After that, coelacanths popped up all along the East African coast in 1991, and here's an illustration on the front of the South African Journal of Science of a specimen caught off Mozambique. In 1997, everyone was greatly surprised when two young American uh, biologists, Anas and Mark, found a living coelacanth right on the other side of the Indian Ocean in Indonesia, and it was found to be a different species, Latimeria monadoensis. Then, uh, spectacularly in 2000, Peter Tim and, and other mixed gas divers discovered a population, a colony of coelacanths in our very own Isimangaliza wetland park in northern Zululand living in canyons. Sadly, Peter Tim died in a diving accident after that, but not while looking for coelacanths. And this is uh, where uh, that colony was discovered, or Sodwana Bay, and the Triton Dive Lodge, you can see the logo top right, 
to this day offers suitably uh, trained and qualified mixed gas divers the opportunity to dive with coelacanths. The discovery of coelacanths in the Isamangalisa Wetland Park led to the establishment of the African Coelacanth Ecosystem Program, led by the Ichthyology Institute um, in Grahamstown, Macondo. Uh, they acquired a remote controlled um, CI submersible and uh, coordinated a multidisciplinary program which extended all the way up the east coast of Africa. Some of the world's leading underwater photographers were attracted to this project, including uh, the Italian Laurent Ballista, and here you can see a spectacular photograph of a coelacanth uh, in Zululand. Coelacanths were also discovered in, in Tanzania in 2003, and in fact, as in the Comores, they had been caught there for centuries by traditional fishermen. Sadly, this specimen was a pregnant uh, female, uh, which had a large number of um, late-term pups inside her. And then more recently, in November 2018, a coelacanth uh, was discovered off the south coast of KwaZulu-Natal, also by mixed gas divers, a relatively shallow depth of less, less than 70 meters. Most recently, I've been involved in coelacanth research um, around Madagascar, and the arrow uh, points to the Onalai River, and offshore of that river is the Onalai Canyon, uh, where most coelacanths have been caught in Madagascar. Our research also revealed a specimen caught a long time ago in Madagascar in 1987, which is on display in a museum in Italy, and which was not generally known. And this is a typical way in which coelacanth specimens are delivered by um, fishermen to the research institutes in Madagascar in a ritual cart. And this is a map that is currently in press uh, with the uh, circles showing the places in southwest Madagascar um, in the um, Anlai um, Canyon where most coelacanths have been caught there. So this map summarizes where Latimeria alumni has been caught uh, in South Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, uh, Kenya, Comores, and Madagascar, and Manado Ensis across on the other side in Indonesia. And the number of captures, a uh, great majority of the Comores, uh, next most is Tanzania and Madagascar, with lower numbers elsewhere. In South Africa, we could easily catch coelacanths, but we've chosen not to. Uh, we chose rather to observe the live specimens. Coelacanth research has continued apace. Um, its genome was sequenced by a team from Rhodes University and 98 other authors from around the world, uh, which was a sensational um, event and revealed among other things that the coelacanth was close to the origin of four-legged animals on land. But in fact, that its closest living relative, the lungfish is even closer to tetrapod evolution. I've got time to mention just two facts about, uh, further facts about the coelacanth. Firstly, its anatomy is an amazing combination of features from bony fish, from cartilaginous fish like sharks, and even a few characteristics of four legged animals. And you can see it has a bony head, it has bony supports to the fins, but it has a cartilaginous, a soft cartilaginous backbone like sharks. And it has many other characteristics of sharks. And then the other point is its breeding behavior. Joby Smith made many accurate predictions about where the coelacanth would live, how it hunted, its habitat preferences, but he didn't make an accurate prediction on how it bred. He predicted that it made a mermaid's purse um, egg case like sharks, but in fact we now know that the coelacanth lays the largest eggs of any fish the size of an orange, and that these eggs hatch inside the mother uh, there you can see the eggs inside uh, a mother coelacanth, they're absolutely enormous. And these eggs contain yolk and the developing embryos inside the mother absorb this yolk as their food, first food source. They also eat a fluid from the oviduct and there is a possibility that they have a placenta-like organ whereby they can extract nutrients and gases uh, with their mother. Now, I've featured an elephant there because prior to our work on the coelacanth, the longest gestation period for any animal known was 22 months for the African elephant. 
That's from the time of fertilization of the eggs to the birth of the young. Well, it's absolutely extraordinary that the coelacanth gestation period is no less than 36 months, three years, 14 months longer than that of the elephant. And it's young when they are born, are fully formed little adults, um, 35 centimeters long, weighing up to half a kilogram. And even more remarkable, this is a fossil of a yolk sac juvenile, which indicates that at least 240 million years ago, coelacanths were already live bearers, long before the mammals uh, developed this method of breeding. Now, one thing we don't know is whether coelacanths guard their young. I predict, it, predict from what we know about their breeding biology that they probably do guard their newly born young, uh, perhaps deep in caves, but this has never been observed. Now, coelacanth has a remarkable natural history, but it also has a remarkable cultural history. And by that, I mean the way in which it's interacted with humans and become part of their culture. At least 26 countries have issued stamps uh, depicting the coelacanth, including many where coelacanths do not occur because it's seen as, as an international sensation and not just something that happens in the Western Indian Ocean. On the left, you can see the first two coelacanth stamps issued by the Comores and that um, they signed by JLB Smith and then some more recent ones. Um, in 1989, South Africa issued the set of four coelacanth stamps uh, to commemorate the um, anniversary of the description of the first coelacanth. And this was one uh, during one of our expeditions uh, by the Jago. A remarkable number of craft works and artworks have been created depicting the coelacanth. This is a um, craft work made from colored materials that Carolyn and I bought uh, from um, Kai Skyma craft workers in the Eastern Cape. Quite a remarkable sculpture. And this is part of my collection of coelacanth models. Uh, going from top left, uh, a 3D printed coelacanth, coke can, macrame, uh, twisted wire, a wooden puzzle, a wire and bead, coelacanth carved from bits of slip slops, uh, a craft uh, metal coelacanth, and even a play doh coelacanth. And you have just a few examples of coelacanths depicted in artworks. And of course, they've also appeared on the banknotes issued by the Comores. So probably more than any other fish, it's penetrated into human culture and been celebrated in these different ways. There's a coelacanth lamp. The bottom left, the coelacanth made out of used tea bags. And on the right is a stainless steel sculpture uh, with a man inside, um, symbolizing the relationship between people and coelacanths. You can even find a coelacanth shaped wooden vein on top of this tower in Mongolia. Now let's end by reviewing some of the points I've made. Firstly, what is the surreal significance of the coelacanth group? Firstly, their enormous longevity, going back 420 million years. Only the sharks among the backboned animals are older than them. They're the ultimate survivors. They survived five major extinction events, although whether they'll survive the current one is a point to be discussed. Although they have a conservative external anatomy, we now know from studying the living fish and the internal organs, they have many advanced features, including their method of breeding. They are related to sharks, lungfishes, and four-legged animals in various ways. And they were crucial in that great evolutionary transition from water onto land. They are perhaps the best example of a living fossil and have provided a wonderful window into the past. They also have a strong cultural history and something I haven't mentioned is a very detailed inventory of every quartz uh, coelacanth specimen has been developed and we also have an inventory of living uh, coelacanth specimens. The unique features of the coelacanth, these are just some of them. Uh, we found that they have a very low hemoglobin count in their blood, so they have to live in very well oxygenated water. They have an extremely slow metabolic rate, probably the slowest of any vertebrate animal. They reach an age of um, in excess of 100 years and a size of up to two kilograms, uh, sorry, um, 100 kilograms. 
uh, although many, most of them are smaller than that. They have a unique pattern of dots, which allows us to identify individuals. Very unusual social behavior in that they gather together in caves during the day. They hunt at night using electroreception and they are ambush predators. They have one of the most advanced breeding styles of any fish, even though they're an ancient group and they're very long pregnancy. Now, of course, with all these characteristics, the coelacanth is an extremely valuable animal in terms of what it can tell us about the past and the present. But it also has many of the life history traits of threatened animals, and we are seriously concerned about its future survival. And these are some of the traits it shares with other threatened animals. It's rare, it's large, it's high on the food pyramid, it a, a, has a very low dispersal rate, it's not a fast swimmer, they produce very few young per breeding, but the young are large. They long lived, specialized. They live in highly diverse habitats and with complex interactions with other species. And they're vulnerable to extinction ca uh, cascades. So if their prey uh, fishes are uh, harmed by our interventions in the oceans, the coelacanths will suffer as well. Uh, we've been very involved in coelacanth conservation as has Hans Frick and his group. And here's Karin Hissman painting a, a drawing on a wall in Moroni. This was at a time when a Japanese fish uh, ship, the Pacific oak, was trying to catch live coelacanths to display an aquarium in Japan. And uh, this campaign was called Let Them Be Where They Are. And Hans and his um, submersible divers even went down and put this message into one of the traps that had been set by the Japanese uh, to catch the fish. The, fortunately, the Comorans are very aware of the importance of their fish. A uh, coelacanth conservation center has been established and they are actively involved in coelacanth conservation um, now. And through our efforts and theirs, the coelacanth is now uh, listed as vulnerable in the International Red Data Book and is also on CITES uh, Schedule 1. Our question I'm often asked is, should we keep a coelacanth in captivity? Would this be something that would allow us to study aspects of its behavior that we can't do in the wild and, and perhaps uh, use it as an educational tool? Well, it's distinctly possible. They would be relatively easy to catch. Whether it's ethical is another issue because of its high conservation um, status. Why? Well, it could only be justified on the basis of research and education. And where? Well, that's a tricky question uh, because many aquaria around the world would want it. And this is perhaps one of the biggest problems in that one can't expect just one aquarium to have it. If, if one aquarium has it, others will want it and there would be a rush on coelacanths. So at the moment, there's no action in this regard. Where the action is, is top right, is that very realistic robotic coelacanths are being created and they may soon be displayed in public aquaria. So to wrap it up, these are the three books that I've written about the Silicon story. I strongly encourage you to, to read them. They are a classic um, example of scientific endeavor with South Africa right in the forefront. And I thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. <clears throat> Prof, what an amazing, amazing presentation. You've literally taken us to the deep blue seas and um, really shared this beautiful, this beautiful creature with you, with, with, with all of us. Um, so I just have uh, just one quick question um, from my side. So in terms of predating um, the silicon, where would, you, where would you classify it? How long has it been in existence for? And what would you say the population of, of the silicanth um, around the world is uh, currently? Because of you've mentioned that, uh, you know, they are quite vulnerable to instinct, uh, instinction as well. Okay, uh, John, the oldest silicanth fossils date back 420 million years, which is a very, very long time. Um, as far as a population size is concerned, the only population for which we have a rough estimate is Grand Comor Islands in the Comores, where Hans Frick and his team, after 22 years of research, estimated that there are perhaps about 500 adult coelacanths there. We don't have population numbers for elsewhere, um, but 
lesser numbers are, are likely to occur off Tanzania and Madagascar. But what we're very excited about is those unexplored canyons off the coast of northern Mozambique, which appear to be good habitat, uh, but they haven't as, as yet been studied. So, I mean, because the coelacanth is a predator near the top of the food pyramid, its numbers would not be high. And we, we you know, we're probably looking at perhaps a thousand specimens, uh, adult specimens, uh, but we still don't know. Sure. Quite interesting research there, definitely. Um, so, um, Vellum, um, I've got a Vellum. I've got a question from Vellum. It says, um, "Was the original coelacanth um, out of range uh, in terms of what we know uh, today of their normal distribution, or may it turn out to be an area that they can be found again?" Yeah, the, uh, you know, for a long time we thought that the coelacanth caught off East London was a stray that was well south of the natural range of the species. Then, uh, because um, for, you know, until 1952, and in fact, until the specimens caught off East Africa, they were only known from the single specimen off East London and then the Comores. But then when coelacanth popped up in Northern Zululand, we realized that, you know, they're closer to us than we thought. And then in late um, 2018, when a living specimen was observed 350 kilometers south of the Isi Mangalisa wetland park in southern uh, KwaZulu Natal, that you know suggests that their colony is even closer to East London, and we think that there are suitable habitats um, off the off the wild coast um, of South Africa, but that's a very difficult area to explore using submersibles and mixed gas because of the very strong currents there. So it may turn out, in fact, that the um, East London coelacanth was not astray, but is near the southern end of their natural distribution. There have also been intriguing um, information brought to our attention that juvenile coelacanths might have been caught by um, um, squid fishermen off Port Elizabeth. And there have even been reports of specimens of coelacanths washing up on the Eastern Cape Coast in the past, but these have never been substantiated. So, you know, the coelacanth has surprised us in so many ways that we need to keep an open mind to the possibility that the East London specimen was not astray, but was in fact at the southern end of their natural distribution. Mm. Sure. No, thank you for that question, uh, Vellum. I think uh, Vellum's question will resonate quite nicely with uh, 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 our guest today, uh, Gavin Lambert, um, uh, who was greeting us earlier on uh, from Amatikulo village, uh, Zulu learning in Zulu Natal. Now, um, uh, Prof, um, if you could just uh, tell us just from based on your experience, um, what would you say is, is, is are some of the key missing um, research, you, you know, research, processes uh, that that maybe are st still need to be done in relation to the silicon? Right, the biggest threat to the silicon at the moment is large mesh gill nets that are being set off, uh, for instance, Tanzania and Madagascar. They're being set to catch sharks for the shark fin industry, but they're also catching silicons as well as dolphins, turtles and dugongs. And this is for a trade of, you know, a sort of expensive soup made from shark fins with the rest of the shark carcass being dis discarded. And I personally don't think that can be justified at all because of the bycatch of these deep set gill nets. So more research needs to be done on that, which will hopefully lead to legislation that if at least controls the use of these nets, if not banning them, in uh, protected areas. The other danger that we need to address is the use of explosives to catch fish and uh, explosives that destroy coral, destroy fishes, including many species that are not eaten by humans. And um, they are a severe danger to coelacanths, as is plastic pollution. Uh, coelacanths have been found with, uh, with plastic in their intestines 
and that that is another threat and even the use of insecticides on land which blows out into the sea um, a study of coelacanths in the Comores has revealed that they have very high levels of DDT and other insecticides um, in their bodies so that's something that also needs to be addressed so you know while we're all we're interested in its natural history and for instance whether it guards its young and uh, to know more about where it's distributed, we also need to focus our research on um, improving measures to conserve uh, this iconic fish. Sure. Prof, uh, let me just, um, you know, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, our, our, our visitors today, you know, just, you know, giving us such wonderful comments, just commenting on the amazing presentation that you've, that you've given. Um, there was actually a comment that was just asking about the beautiful hat that you had earlier on. <laughs> Hopefully you can tell us a little bit about that. But before we get into that, um, uh, Penny Abbott is actually asking a, um, one of the critical questions that perhaps we, we always need to touch on. Um, issues of climate change. So the warming of oceans, um, do they have any impact on, on, on the city can? It's uh, you know, climate change will have an impact on coelacanths just as it has on all marine organisms. And of course, we must remember that global warming is, is a simplification. Climate change is not just warming, it's also, uh, it's mainly an increase in the amplitude of extreme events. So things will be warmer and colder, wetter and drier. Uh, we have interfered with the ability of the planet to balance its climate and we're going to suffer along with uh, marine animals. Um, one of the most obvious effects of climate change is on the bleaching of coral reefs and um, you know, coelacanths do live around coral reefs so, and their prey is likely to suffer and that is, you know, I mentioned this point of they're vulnerable to extinction cascades or the reduction in numbers of their prey. So it's definitely something that does concern us. Yeah. Prof, um, you know, um, yeah, just um, um, a lot of a lot of you know comments. Just saying, thank you so much for the wonderful presentations. You know, a lot of the stuff that it's coming up on our comment section. It's literally just to say thank you. This was absolutely awesome. Everybody just, um, you know, acknowledging the, the beautiful work that you're doing. Um, but I have to, I have to just um, ask this question um, just from my side. Um, I think, um, you know, the Marlin Award was, 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 was an absolute, you know, deserving um, honor for you or towards you. Um, so how do you feel about that? What can you say? What can you tell us all about that? You know, what emotions went through uh, were you expecting it? Is it something that, um, um, how do you feel about it? Tell us more. Well, John, if I could preface my comments by saying that I've omitted to mention that a staff member of Sanby, Dr. Kerry Sink, is one of the most advanced coelacanth researchers today, who's doing remarkable work. She was responsible uh, together um, with the part of the German team in um, identifying individual coelacanths and creating an inventory of specimens based on the unique pattern of dots. And she's also leading the project, which is following up on uh, possible coelacanth observations um, off our Eastern Cape coast. So, you know, we really need to recognize Sanby and, and Dr. Kerry Sink, a very important role in modern coelacanth research. As far as the Marloth Medal is concerned, it was a great honor, especially considering that JLB Smith was the first person to be awarded it. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's special because late in one's career, when one is no longer an active researcher at a university or research institute, and you're sort of muddling away, uh, trying to publish books and so on, for people to remember you and recognize your contribution is very important. And I think I've been fortunate in my career in that I've, I've served in, in, in a variety of capacities as a head of a, a university department, the head of a research institute, leading up the education program of the aquarium, and then also working um, in the Middle East. 
And, uh, you know, since then, since 2015, I've basically been writing um, and sharing um, my knowledge and my enthusiasm with science, for science with uh, people from all walks of life. And that has been very rewarding. Sure. Prof, uh, we're not going to keep you any longer. Um, I just want to say thank you, give big thanks to you. Uh, thank you for the work that you've done and uh, the work that you continue to do. Uh, thank you for sharing your passions with us. Um, you know, without you, you know, we would not get access to this amazing information. Um, and just to, to wrap it up and remind everybody uh, that um, all the three books um, that Prof has worked on and, um, and literally uh, written, amazing uh, Stilicand, um, uh, Fishy Smiths and uh, Annotated Old Four Legs, uh, they are all on special at the Kistenbosch Bookshop. Um, you're literally getting 15%. So please make sure you go out and get yourself a copy. Um, that amazing silicon, I mean, you need to get that book. It's a, it's a wonderful edition for, um, for your bookshelf. And it's, it's good for children, getting them into what's happening in terms of our blue, blue deep seas. Uh, without any waste of time, thank you everybody for joining us uh, this morning um, to this wonderful, wonderful talk. Literally, you know, excellent presentation by Prof, uh, just taking us through the beautiful journey of, of this beautiful species that we've just um, spoken about. Um, the next Wednesday talk is going to be in the next two weeks time. So for now, please make sure um, to stay safe. Remember to sanitize, uh, keep your mask on, and keep a safe uh, following distance. Um, from my side, and uh, Prof, any last uh, words from your side? I just to thank you, John, for hosting this event. It's been great fun. And I look forward to hearing uh, from some of the participants. No, definitely. We will definitely be collecting all the messages and uh, definitely sending them to you. Uh, from all our stakeholders, Room to Grow, thank you so much for partnering with uh, Sandy Kistenbosch and making this possible straight nature. All the team, Belinda, Kathy Abbott, thank you so much for putting the program together. Uh, without uh, the team, this would not be possible. So thank you very much. From my side, um, we are done. And uh, I've learned so much from you, Prof. So thank you so much for your time. And we wish for more blessings. We wish that God keeps you for us so that you can share more and more stuff uh, with us in future. So thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Stay safe and see you guys next session.